Welcome everyone um, to this pre-launch of the 2022 Development Studies Association uh, Conference entitled Just Sustainable Futures in an Urbanizing and Mobile World. Uh, this conference will run online from the 6th to the 8th of July 2022 and um, is hosted and organized with the DSA by University College London. Uh, my name is Karen Levy and I work in UCL's Development Planning Unit and I'll be chairing this pre-conference webinar. Um, just to emphasize for folks a few housekeeping issues, this session is being recorded um, and it will go up on the website and um, attend just for your information attendees won't be visible on that recording. Um, could I please ask you um, uh, to use our question and answer function rather than the chat function. The chat function is open to you, but uh, it would be great if you could use the question and answer function as well. And, and we will have some time at the end of our session um, to, to have a wider discussion with you. So this session is entitled The Politics and Governance of Sustainable Urban Futures. And it's a special session for, for a number of reasons. It is, of course, the first of the three uh, pre-conference events that are going to lead up to the 2022 DSA conference. But the DSA conference committee has also dedicated this webinar to Vanessa Watson, a colleague and friend, professor of city planning at the University of Cape Town, who sadly died last year. We have an outstanding panel of speakers who will acknowledge Vanessa's extraordinary contribution as they address uh, the topic of this session. I just want to start by saying a few words about Vanessa, by acknowledging her uh, inspiring engagement with an, an outstanding contribution to at least four uh, areas. Academic scholarship in the field of urban planning, where she critiqued traditional planning practice and its colonial roots. Uh, she dissected and challenged new trends uh, generated by the increasing marketization of urban planning. And she contributed to and pushed the boundaries of planning theory, in particular in the context of the DSA through her contribution to and promotion of, uh, of the need for Southern theory. She also made an enormous contribution to urban planning education, not only at the University of Cape Town, but also within the African planning schools and to international um, debates about the education of planners. Um, Vanessa worked collectively and closely with others, uh, not only for the revision of the department where she and I was educated and where she became a member of staff, but she also worked tirelessly for the establishment of the African Association of Planning Schools, um, the African Center for Cities at UCT, and the Global Planning Education Association Network. Vanessa also saw activism as a central part of reshaping the content and pedagogy of planning education, uh, bringing planning into direct conversation with poor urban dwellers and their claims for more just living conditions. And finally, her activities in these three areas inevitably led to her contribution to the planning profession itself, to question and challenge the ambitions, the conceptions and the practices of urban planning, leading to her recent important work on planning integrity. Vanessa's legacy in all these fields is vast, uh, significant, and in many ways unique. Our speakers today will acknowledge the content of her work in different ways on a topic to which she was committed in all her endeavors, the promotion of justice in the planning and governance of urban areas. Our first speaker today will be Gotham Baum, 
uh, from the Indian Institute of Human Settlements in Bangalore, where he is the Associate Dean at the School of Human Development, as well as the Senior Lead on academic, um, Academics and Research. Among his many accomplishments, uh, Gotham in, 19, in, in 2018 co-edited the Routledge Companion to Planning in the Global South with Vanessa Watson and Smita Srinivasan. Our second speaker is Mona Fawaz, a professor in urban studies and planning at the uh, American University of Beirut, where she co-founded the Beirut Urban Lab, a regional research center invested in working uh, towards more inclusive, just and viable cities. Our third and final speaker is Susan Parnell, Professor of the School of Geography at the University of Bristol and Emeritus Professor at the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town, where she worked closely with, with Vanessa Watson. Before I hand over to these speakers, I, I, in this session on the politics and governance of sustainable urban uh, futures, we've developed the original sets of questions uh, to reflect a series, a set of tensions in relation to future governance. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen um, to, to, to uh, present those briefly um, to you. Um, these tensions, uh, first of all, the tensions between the diverse claims for the right to the city of different social movements and representation and accountability in urban governance. And here we pick up the question, what political claims uh, are poor rural and urban communities as well as migrant and displaced resident, residents making and what forms of political participation and planning help bring about just sustainable futures. The second tension is that around science policy engagement and governance. And the key question here is how are the political claims translated into knowledges that contribute to the formulation and implementation of policy and planning that addressed just sustainable futures. The third tension links to the question of globalization that's leading to increased commodification and financialization of land and housing and governance that aspires to address equality and justice. And here the question is, well, how are cities in the global south becoming integrated into new flows of capital and new superpower struggles, including around investments in infrastructure and real estate, and with what implications for the governance of development? And how can commoning respond? And what is the scope for linkages between movements for urban and rural justice across the global south and global north to address these widening cleavages? And the fourth and final tension is that related to uh, the global targets and um, local policy and governance. And here the question is, what are the challenges of localization of the global agendas like the Sustainable Development Goals, the new urban agenda, the Sendai framework? And what are the implications for multiple scales of governance and just rural uh, urban rural linkages? And what is the scope for cities to collaborate with each other in pursuing the localization uh, of, of targets? So folks, with that framing in mind, I'd like to call on um, Gotham Baum, our first speaker. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, thank you everyone for being here and for having me. It is, it's a real honor to be able to speak in a session that's dedicated to Vanessa. Um, I will be very frank, I think I, while I had the, the chance to work with her and be a co-author with her on the volume that Karen mentioned, I principally have to say that I always experienced and thought of Vanessa as my teacher in some ways. I was never formally taught by her, but over the years that I knew her, I turned to her multiple times, not only her work, but also her herself um, as someone who helped me think 
um, as someone who pushed me in directions that were really powerful uh, in ways in which not only that they articulated something that was analytically so sharp, but was also ethically deeply grounded in the way Karen was describing a lot of what drove Vanessa's scholarship was this sense, not only of a search for justice within planning and governance, but also a sort of belief and optimism in the practice, even when structural inequalities persisted. I mean, this was an author who wrote about deep difference in the context of South Africa's post-apartheid urbanism as almost the limit of participation, for example, a text that, that was so pivotal for me to understand the limits of, of certain forms of practice, uh, even when they were so theoretically appealing, like the idea of participation in co-production. But Vanessa was not a cynical writer. Vanessa was a critical writer whose real hope in the Raymond Williams sense was to think of something radical as something that made hope possible and not despair more appealing. Um, and so what I thought I would do is very much mimic some of the discussions we used to have when we were thinking about the volume of our planning where we kept pushing and thinking of our questions together. And on the transitions that Karen has put out, I wanted to use my time to raise a set of questions around the first of the tension she articulated, which were the diversity of claims of the right to the city and questions of inclusion and urban equity, but thinking about it actually the way Vanessa would prompt me to think about it, which is to think about it not from the perspective of social movements, which is my comfort zone in a sense, but actually to think about it from the perspective of the apparatus of public policy and planning, to think about it from the point of view in some sense of the state of that what was governing. So what I want to talk a little bit about actually is specifically to leave you with three questions at the end, which I think we should take in debating about futures and a couple of propositions around questions of social protection. By social protection, I mean the broad world of what we consider safety nets, um, both protections that uh, accrue to residents and citizens um, on the basis of their presence um, that are more universal, food, health, education, but also those that accrue to people in their identity as workers. Uh, and here I talk about rights associated with work in the American discourse, the distinction between social protection and social security. And one of the questions that I feel that sustainable urban futures have to grapple with, particularly in thinking about the urban from the South, is how we theorize the framework and practice of social protection within structural, economic, and spatial informality. Um, and this is fundamentally what I want to leave on the table today for our discussion. During the last two or three years of the pandemic, I was involved in multiple ways around COVID relief work, as so many of us were. In the first year of the pandemic in 2020, I was part of relief work from the state and within the state. And in the second, I was part of non-state movement-based relief work. I want to suggest that relief during COVID-19, all the different things that states had to try to do um, in order to reach residents and workers is actually a fantastic archive and almost diagnostic to understand social protection systems as they existed before the pandemic and to trace what's happening to them after. In many ways, in the Indian urban, states actually made multiple moves that they were not making during every day pre-COVID as social protection mechanisms, but they had to make as relief. And those relief work, the way they found workers, the entitlements that came out as relief, tell us a certain set of stories. I want to offer a brief set of examples and then leave two questions. One of the things that was striking to us is that when relief had to be given. The first question was, who was it being given to? What was the basis of claims to receive an entitlement? Who was asking for it and on what grounds? Relief work had some of the closest articulations to multiple categories of work and vulnerability that we had seen in urban India. There was directed cash transfers towards domestic workers, towards transport workers, towards construction workers, towards street vendors, given acknowledging and on the basis of their identity as workers. Now, in some ways, this represents a kind of work-based claim to social protection that within informality, we have long been struggling for. 
and relief work actually hastened that recognition of an entitlement that came on the basis of a claim of work, but a work category that is understood to be part of the informal economy and not part of the formal economy where social protection and work-based entitlements are the norm. The challenge was this, when those claims came on the basis of work, the delivery was the weakest. And what I mean by this is even state governments that were willing to give cash transfers to domestic workers, street vendors, and construction workers found that they did not have the operational institutional infrastructure, the databases, the linked bank accounts, the notion of where they were for migrant and multi-local lives in order to actually deliver that agreed upon entitlement to workers. In some way, the very informality that had given a certain flexibility and protection to forms of work had become exactly that that made the delivery of actual social protection entitlements impossible during COVID. At the same time, when social protection was framed universally, when food was given to all residents regardless of work status, the delivery of those entitlements was at its most successful. Now, in one way, this complicates two parts of the tension of social protection that I think are very important for us to pick up as we think about urban futures. When claims are made universally, there seems to be an ease of delivery. When claims are made on the basis of work status, when that work status is based on informal work, then the delivery mechanisms do not seem to exist in order to precisely reach those that are meant to be outside formal recognition and norms. Even as the recognition across the world of informal workers has begun to interface more directly with state governments. I point to this as a tension because one of the languages that we have about futures is to always talk about universal social protection. And one of the lessons that the operationalization of such protection has left with me over the last two years is the question of saying, at what cost does one universalize? And what it has left me with is the articulation of the tension in this way. Increasingly, the temptation to speak of basic income, of universal social protection flaws, is tending to displace claims to social protection made on the basis of work. What this means is a tension being set up between citizenship rights or place-based rights and rights of labor and rights as return to work. Now, in some ways, if we make this debate about a delivery efficiency, we will always lean towards the universal. But in many cases, if we agree to that efficiency side reorientation, we risk a fundamental depoliticization of social protection that should worry us deeply. The claims that are made to social protection from the basis of work and as workers are also the basis of an urban politics to the right of the city. It is the construction of what we know as labor, as a kind of personhood, a basis of belonging, a claim that is rooted in dignity and contribution. Every country in the world is a history of the distinction between what is considered welfare and what is considered entitlement. The language of beneficiaries that has followed the universal delivery systems of social protection, to me signals this risk of depoliticizing the delivery of social entitlements, and social protection, particularly in places where the majority of workers are in the informal economy. At the same time, this analytical and theoretical critique, Vanessa would warn us, is not sufficient on its own if we do not then ask ourselves, what is then the delivery mechanism that makes claims to social entitlements made by informal workers as informal workers actually effective in delivery? Is it that large scale worker federations or local governments find ways to recognize, enumerate and account for informal workers where the terms of recognition are not an adverse incorporation for informal workers? Federations like WeGo, um, the economist Kate Maher at LSE have talked about adverse incorporation very closely because increasingly we're not at a point where we were with informality, where the question is to say, we must recognize the informal as equally legitimate to the informal. The question, the informal is not invisible, it never has been. Increasingly the tension of the current urban and as we proceed is actually about the questions of what terms of formalization, what does formalization mean? And here, the presence on the database, the way in which a work category is recognized, how that work category leads to delivery, 
but does not lead to an incorporation that imposes costs or terms of recognition that informal workers cannot bear. This question of what, say, South African urbanists that were colleagues of Vanessa would call a soft regulation. How much do you recognize as a state to play your developmental role and own it? But how much do you let alone in order not to kill precisely the flexibility that allowed informality to thrive? One of the ways in which I think this is a question that Vanessa would really think with is because it has the dimensions that undercut so much of her work. It has a normative base. It has questions of ethical trade-offs to be made at the very beginning. It has an analytical query, which means to understand what does it mean to claim social protection as citizen, resident, migrant, or worker, and the different implications of this, not just for social protection, but for urban politics, for democratic practice, for dignity, for selfhood, for urban belonging. But it also has an operational question, which is what are the systems of delivery that can reach informal workers, not just in times of crisis, but within the everyday, but that also respect the particular history of their work conditions and the conditions of informality that have been beneficial to them, recognizing even those that have been harmful to them. This combination of what some of us who, me and some others have been trying to think together recently of questions that are able to hold the normative, the analytical and the operational together. To me, this is a legacy of Vanessa's way of thinking. It's a refusal to not ask the question of the operational as seriously as the question of the normative or the analytical. And I think that a question that she would grapple with or she, she would insist that we grapple with today is to take our own normative desire for social protection, universal social protection, and query analytically the question of the universal and push ourselves to say, what does it mean for them to imagine operational systems that both respect the need to have large scale universal structures but that are also specific, not in the way of targeting, but in the way of recognizing the multiplicity of claims that need to exist as social protection becomes not just a welfare or developmental good, but a fundamental building block of the right to the city. Um, and I'll stop there and pick this up later. Um, and I think that one of the things that, again, just I want to take this moment to mark is in yet again, how much in the last two years as one was practicing on these questions, I kept returning to her relationship to knowledge um, as a practitioner. And it made me realize that how important it was that she always made a distinction between the kind of knowledge you need for practice and the kind of knowledge you need in order to keep some distance from practice and how both of them in the end were meant to come together. So Karen, back to you. Thank you so much, Gotham. Uh, that was a beautiful tribute to, to Vanessa um, and, and raised some really, really important issues, which I hope we can pick up in the, in the question and answer further. I'd like to hand over to Mona Fawaz now. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Gotham. It's a hard act to uh, follow. Thank you really to colleagues in the Development Studies Association for inviting me. It's a real honor. It's an incredible honor to be speaking in memory and honor of Vanessa Watson. I've never met Vanessa, but her work has been so incredibly inspiring and influential to me that I recall vividly the day I heard she passed away that I felt I lost a mentor and a friend, although I had never spoken to her. Hearing Gotham now, I think that uh, I, was, uh, I was right in thinking so. As you'll see in the presentation, I, uh, I'm going to make a lot of, uh, a lot of what, what is an imperative for uh, justice that guides a planning practice is inspired by the kind of uh, challenges that uh, Vanessa Watson had uh, raised for us. Um, so when I will begin, as she would have liked me to begin by really anchoring myself where I am located now. So this is Lebanon, Beirut. Uh, we're in Southwest Asia, right on the Mediterranean, tiny country of 5 million people, smaller than any mega city, with the capital city Beirut being about 1.3 um, million people. This is Beirut. You can see very few green spaces ex except for the campus of the American University right here. And that's the lab where um, I am sitting. And so uh, Lebanon has, uh, Lebanon and Beirut over the last few years have experienced a series of overlapping catastrophes and crises that have rubbed the country and really severely affected the population. 
And with every downturn, colleagues and friends have spoken of the perfect storm and sort of imagined that that's it, that's the end, that nothing worse is actually going to happen. And then something else happens. Uh, how else would you think of the fact uh, that um, in less than two years, the country's population increased by 25% due to the refugee influx from neighboring Syria? Or again, the coincidence of the COVID-19 crisis with the announcement of the national government that it will default on its foreign debt repayment without a restructuring plan, which today, to the, two years later, we still don't have, or no recovery plan, no social protection. Or the fact that citizens and refugees have had to face the COVID lockdown while watching the national currency and consequently their incomes drop by 10% every month. And in less than two years, it went by more than lost more than 90% of its value. One in three is unemployed. Poverty rates, as you can see, are above 82%. Extreme poverty is above is 40%. So when in uh, August 2020, some 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate dropped the city, killing hundreds, injuring thousands, the perfect storm was closing. And it was very much in the aftermath of the Beirut port blast in August 2020 that things took an even more urgent turn for me. The blast had really wreaked havoc in the city. One in three buildings, as you can see here, it's a port city and it's really very much in extreme close proximity. The port is in close proximity to the city. So you can see all of this is very severely affected. One in three buildings were badly affected. And what happened is that colleagues and I were recurrently solicited as planners. And many residents in the devastated neighborhoods would come to us and say, uh, how can we, what can we do? What can you do as planners? How can we rebuild the city? They were distrustful of state agencies. They were wary of a municipality they never trusted that was anyway ineffective. And they were terrorized by the, prospect, uh, by the prospect of another reconstruction model that would replicate our earlier planning experiences such as the Beirut historic core after the civil war that basically displaced everyone and turned uh, the city's heart into a uh, uh, a financial asset that international and local companies compete over. So despite our experiences with the practice of planning, people in Beirut still aspire to recover their neighborhoods with planning. I think that realities like this make the work of Vanessa Watson really meaningful as a planner, as a teacher, as a researcher, but also as a citizen. Watson challenged us to think where planning and its practice stand from these real realities, the actual realities, what can planners deploy from their repertoire of action, from their profession? What can they offer if they want to be more than distraught citizens, but really act as a profession? How does a profession that prides itself to stand for the common good and work through action, not mere analysis and gesturing, demonstrate, how can it demonstrate its effectiveness in a city devastated by intractable political, economic, health, and social crisis? And when we speak of planning from the South, as Vanessa Watson did, we are talking more than a theoretical turn. We are actually talking about being anchored in a place where uh, the failed plans are plans of students we've actually taught. And um, the difficult reality that we want to address is one that we're living in. It's not a case study. It's not something we're going to write an academic paper about, not only at least, it's something we want to see transform. And from this position, it's important, but it's also insufficient to recognize planning as a culprit to the reality that one seeks to redress. And here, I mean, I agree that there's no doubt and uh, I, that as Watson pointed out in Africa, and it's very relevant in Lebanon, we have outdated planning tools and the colonial legacy of a French mandate here in Lebanon has incredibly affected uh, the city today and rendered planning not only ineffective, but actually culprit in the making of the overlapping crisis. If we think of, uh, the work of those Lefebvre called the urbanists, the planners, the designers, the urban regulators, the architects, the journalists that celebrate their work, we, the universities that teach the curricula that they, uh, that, they, that, they, in, that they endorse or aspire to, it's very clear that uh, planning has been part of the making of, uh, of the crisis. And I've put here a map of Beirut just to point out to the fact that we began to adopt cadastral maps. We never had them before and recognize natural landscapes as property 
with the French mandate, and that since then planning has really worked to uh, financialize the city over the last 30 years in ways that, as you can see on the map, one in uh, four apartments is vacant, uh, many are threatened with demolition, eviction is rampant, and uh, much, uh, much of Beirut functions actually as a space for financial investment or as a storage for wealth rather than a place to live in. And yet, and very much in echo with what Gotham has just said, residents in Beirut, myself included, still cling to the basic promise that planning makes for collectivity, that we can live together, that we can imagine, shape, and occupy in the future the shared spaces in which we conduct our everyday lives, and that planning can offer us the means to do so. And it's a huge challenge. I suspect it's an aspiration that really moves a lot of uh, urban planners, development planners, um, foster who are trying to uh, foster to use the profession or make it do good, and evidently um, with the legacy of Anasa Watson, but also the work of Faranak Miraftab and others, the Southern Turn uh, has asked us to anchor the work in the reality and make planning effective in, uh, effectively uh, effective in these contexts. And here I really want to stop and raise the questions or paraphrase the questions that uh, Watson has raised when she asked planners to actually be meaningful. And when she asked for planning theory, not to be a generic universal uh, language, but actually something applicable applicable in real context. And she said, how do we plan when states are fractured, weak, and or simply correct, corrupt? How do we plan when civil society is divided, fractured, and really not a natural source of uh, democracy? When citizens do not mere, are not merely peaceful contenders uh, deliberately uh, discussing issues, but actually they are asserting their demand for creating facts on the ground rather than dialogue, and sometimes violently. When NGOs and social networks don't create social capital, but rather reproduce the interest of their donors. These hard questions, and they are very hard if you're trying to go beyond writing and you're trying to go to, to answer some of this and actually make planning effective. Uh, these questions require primarily that we reinvent the categories through which we think planning and organize it. So in the remaining time that I have, I want to briefly discuss how we've been trying to uh, sort of raise a Vanessa challenge to make planning effective from the Beirut Urban Lab and really just focusing on one single experience which is Beirut's post-blast reconstruction. Um, we've, been, we've been doing so by trying to rethink critically the categories of planning, what gives it legitimacy, what processes should be in place, what visions can be made. And uh, just to, to be clear, the first step is really to understand that uh, reconstruction has occurred in the last two years in the quasi absence of the state. So we've had uh, international na non-governmental organization and local ones fix homes. And I love this map that we did, we did in the lab, realize the colors are not clear enough but they actually signaled different NGOs that were working in different neighborhoods of the city. And each one of them was fixing an apartment, repairing an individual unit and taking stock of their work by counting one and another home. As if you can imagine the city as the collection of, an individ of individual homes rather than shared, a shared space to be lived in. And of course, NGOs compete with each other as we know well in the literature. So it would come at no surprise that two years after the blast, or almost two years less than one in three people have returned, and that much of what is happening in the neighborhood is actually competition between landlords and tenants, one trying to prevent the other from returning because they want to do something else with the house, uh, tensions between refugees and low-income tenants but who will occupy the more affordable houses, and a zillion other real issues that happen because the actual fabric of the city is fragmented, and it's very difficult to build a collective. So for us, it became first really important to give some visibility about what was happening. And at the Beirut Urban Lab, we've been working for a few years now trying to create that visibility to produce maps in a city that didn't have an actual accurate map to produce knowledge about who's building what and where. And I'll skip because there's not enough time. So in the aftermath of the blast, we, we tried to set in place an urban observatory that would begin to provide information about 
where damage is, to collect information about who's working where, uh, what are the most vulnerable neighborhoods, what are their factors, because that allows for mutual visibility and eventually for uh, collaborative work, uh, at least we, we hoped so. The second bigger challenge was to actually make plan to reinvent planning in this process. And to us, uh, planning and recovery start from collective spaces. You don't start from individual homes, or at least not only. There's work that needs to be done in building, in, in actually investing in the political, the most political dimension of planning, which is the one that answers how will we live together? How will we collectively imagine uh, our neighborhoods? And so we resorted first, sort of with what is imagined as the last step of planning, we resorted first to visuals and to meetings in which we allowed people to sit together to imagine actually themselves as collectivities and to basically be able to project themselves into a possible future of what could be as urban citizens, whether they're refugees or residents or citizens, irrespective of uh, belonging to really uh, begin that conversation around the materiality of urban life and create that imagination because these people don't sit actually the residents don't sit together they don't see themselves as one group so to actually begin to create that collective experience that there can be a we that imagines the space in which we are and this is very much performative more than anything else but as you can see it begins to create that sense that we can aspire as people being in a city towards something and gradually uh, the idea was to shift towards specific projects tactically that would uh, incrementally build collaborations, commit people to certain paths. So we go beyond the talking to the actual organizing of certain visions. So we've developed uh, on the left knowledge bases about the neighborhoods, about that highway project that's been resisted by residents for 20 years and by activists but that the city wanted to implement and we've sort of turned it into a collective shared open space and we've tried to uh, design the elements but design them very much collaboratively with other planners with other ngos that are working in the neighborhood but also by bringing in and roping in municipal authorities that had not stepped into the neighborhood so that they begin to also uh, collectively form some kind of a coalition working towards something else. The, sum, the semblance of a de facto planning structure that we uh, aspire to eventually uh, multiply into thinking about the other public spaces. Um, this is uh, really like a work of stitching elements, but also pushing different actors that don't norm normally collaborate or see each other as uh, working together towards uh, a process of committing towards a certain uh, a certain option, a certain future. Of course, the most challenging part in all of this is to build the legitimacy of planning. And if uh, the sudden turn in planning has done a great job at uh, showing how states can be uh, sexist, racist, eth uh, ethnically biased, um, and really located the state as the center of uh, of the problem with planning, but at the same time keeping the profession of planning tied to the idea that there can be a state that does it. And as you can see here, this is a wall right with the background of the Beirut port. What you're seeing here is a wall where activists wrote, my government did this, deliberately pointing the finger to uh, the public authorities' negligence towards the blast. And uh, for the last two years, uh, activists write this and the city authorities come and erase it and then you write it again. And it's uh, it's an endless game. But it's really important because it tells you that if you want to build something beyond allowing the fragmentation that the NGOs and the INGO community fosters, you really need to create a guarantor for planning. You need to rope in pieces of the state to, to begin to create some uh, some kind of legitimacy for uh, the process of planning. So what we've been trying to do is to stitch together public actors, activists, uh, scholars, and uh, actors from the public authorities who are willing to do that into some kind of a planning unit that would uh, actually give legitimacy to the process and incrementally build um, beyond um, beyond uh, the project. So I realize I'm out of time. And so just really quickly in closing to say that uh, I think that experiences like this 
uh, sort of try to enact the aspiration of uh, connecting what Gotham put as sort of the no normative, the operational and the analytical together. They try to uh, sort of turn planning into an act of knowing uh, and reconsidering what knowledge is, but very much from a certain place from a certain specific place and towards meaningful ends. And while planning really cannot reshape the fundamental relations between society, right? They it cannot reimagine the world. I, I think it still is capable of holding a place or a space for justice and a space that we very much still need to actualize. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mona. Um, and I'd like to hand over to Sue. Uh, our final speaker, um, and Sue, you, you have uh, equal time there. Thank you so much. And uh, Mona, so lovely to hear you talking about Vanessa, who you clearly know in just so many deep and intimate ways. And I think that's one of the things which is extraordinary about the scholarly community is that we do actually connect um, through our words, through our writings, through our meetings, and also through our activities. Um, and we'll see that time and time again through the things that you've said and that, that Gotham has said. Um, colleagues, it, 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 Vanessa's work is, is, has already been invoked today um, uh, as an exemplar for Southern urbanists in that what she was able to do was to span this deep empirical investigation I don't know if theoretical reflection is high or low, but high theoretical reflection, a kind of a savvy practical application, and also some institution building, all of a normative face. Um, and perhaps because she was a planner, um, in doing that, her focus was almost always the question of urban governance. Um, and what she was really interested in was this idea of how do we aim to always reform or to redefine the institutions of state control? Or how do we guide, how do we nudge, how do we uh, inspire political resistance, which would be transformative for the majority? Um, and I think unusually, perhaps, she was also deeply concerned uh, with how do we structure an alternative pedagogy? And, so it's very easy to celebrate her. Um, this is a woman who did an extraordinary amount of a, um, a career that was very, very influential. But I think we can also slightly step back from that um, and learn from her as we collectively seek to evolve an alternative mode of engaged urban development um, thinking and action. Um, we can call it what we like, we can call it Southern urbanism, we can call it engaged urban development. I think that's what's less important. But what sets the stuff that we've all been talking about, and you'll have heard Gotham saying it in relation to social protection, Mona so eloquently with respect to a place, what sets this apart is, is unlike much more prescriptive or monogamous points of theoretical departure, what engaged urban scholarship I think implies is the ability to sustain high quality academic research by the conventional metrics, to move beyond narrow sectarian positions and to eschew simplistic interventions. So that creates an, or demands really an alternative disposition. We've got to think and act in a, a fundamentally different way from previous generations and perhaps to the way that people act in other parts of the world. If we are able to do that, it seems to me it unlocks the ability to deal with the conceptual and operation ten operational tensions of urban governance of the kind that Karen set out at the beginning of the session in which I'm going to use as my uh, mechanism for, for looking at uh, how we might do that. Just to say that working in this kind of applied, um, engaged way, um, politically um, embedded way is not the same thing as operating without a conceptual base. And if we have a look at Vanessa's work, and I'm not suggesting that everybody should adopt the same conceptual point of departure, but I think for her, her piece on, on conflicting rationalities came to be her raison d'etre, if you like, the idea that there was deep difference, that the issues were complex, that the belief that planning could not solve, but that the tools and the instruments of planning 
could be used and could be amended to navigate, if not to resolve, the tensions of urban governance. That, it seems to me, is the hallmark of the way that Vanessa acted, if not of particularly uh, of, of individual pieces. Let me try and kind of amplify this um, with respect to the themes uh, that we've, we've been talking about uh, here. And the first theme that Karen put up of these tensions was really this issue around the diverse claims to the right to the city, um, which are contested. Um, and I'm sure across the rest of the conference, we're going to be talking about that uh, in more detail. So the first thing I think is important, and when I was so interested to hear you articulating and echoing exactly the same thing, what Vanessa did here was to produce sustained empirical vest investigation basis on, based on the case that she knew well. Not all, but the vast majority of what Vanessa wrote was about Cape Town. It's where she lived, it's what she knew, it's where she made her first and most enduring contribution. And an example of that for me uh, comes out of the moment of transition um, at the point, uh, at the end of apartheid. So long before the idea of the right to the city had been embraced by southernists, it had been theirs and Lefebvre kind of ideas. Vanessa took up and, and a couple of colleagues took up uh, an empirical investigation which to investigate the fundamental spatial logic of the apartheid state, which was to deny the black majority the right to the city. It literally said, you may not come into the city, you are not urban. And what's fascinating for me about that 1996 piece, it was published in 96, it was produced a little earlier, uh, is that uh, what Vanessa and Magsy and Peter Wilkinson did there was that they did not themselves make the claim for the rights of black people to urban life. Okay? They didn't speak, in other words, on behalf of a constituency, but what they did do was they documented based on very careful household surveys and very extensive field research not quite ethnography, but some pretty close to some ethnographic investigation, the significance of the claims that the illegal movement represented. In other words, what did the de facto occupation of the city of Cape Town by black people represent? In other words, what was happening here was that the role of the researcher was not in claim making, but in claim verification. The agency continued to lie with the actors themselves with the occupants of land. I thought that study was particularly interesting because it did a whole lot of other things as well. The second thing that it did, which was more than simply documenting a right, part of the legitimizing, got me hearing that e the echo of the sort of importance of the documentary process, that soft regulation, that soft visibility, making the state see uh, its residents. But the other thing it did was that it documented and exposed uh, the cost that was borne by migrants of defying the state in order to make the claim to the city. And in particular, what she was able to do was to look at the, the, the true interpersonal cost and the intergenerational burden that was encountered because of the denial of rights. Because basically what happened was that in order to live both in the city and in the countryside, African households split, they flexed, they stretched, they moved in order to hold, <coughs> excuse me, a place uh, in the city. I think the third thing that that empirical piece of work was able to do uh, was that it was very clear about laying bare the role of the state in both driving this dysfunctional land system and perpetuating it. And they look very particularly at housing policy and the technical aspects of housing policy as a formative driver of the burden of the failed right to the city and as a point that would require massive reform in order to secure the right to the city. So it's a deeply political piece of work insofar as it engages the everyday, it exposes the underlying political economy of what was going on, and it was transformative in its intentions of shifting uh, where that was. So the first thing there, the act of research, of empirical work, of sustained empirical work, of knowing a place, of understanding its complexity. The second thing that, um, and I'm going to use one of each of the uh, 
intentions that were set out at the beginning of the session to try and use Vanessa to kind of illuminate that uh, in unevenly, but uh, nonetheless try and do that. If we look at um, the tension really of, of kind of how do you align the science policy engagement and the governance debate? Now, I always find Vanessa, she was fascinating to me. I, I met her when I was a student, actually. Um, she was already working at, at the Urban Problems Research Unit down in Cape Town, and I was based up at FITS, and we just started something called Plan Act. Um, and she was deeply involved in something called DAG, the Development Action Group down in Cape Town. Um, and what, from a very early point, what Vanessa displayed was her ability to work on planning questions on, through both formal and informal institutions. And I think what she did so well across her career was not to choose either or. Some of us will, some people will always work with civil society and some people will always work with the state. But I think that ability to be able to see the planning conundrum from both sides through in-depth engagement with uh, the, the various parties was something which led her to that deep understanding, to that visceral understanding of, of conflicting rationalities, of deep difference, of where the points of inability to connect were. But the thing which strikes me most importantly in the context of Southern urbanism is that Vanessa chose not only to work through, and she almost always worked through these interface organizations, um, UPRU, the ACC, the African Association of Planning Schools, but she also built them. So in other words, where there were not the necessary institutions, she catalyzed and ensured that they would be there. And it seems to me that if we're going to actually have sustained and durable action to build sustainable futures, then those institutional apparatuses are imperative for inducting a new generation, for ensuring credibility in the engagement between parties, um, and for facilitating and uh, taking us further and faster in the dialogue about the reconciliations of those tensions. Karen, your third uh, tension that you, you popped up was the one around um, globalization leading to increased commodification and financialization of land and housing. And if you looked at the program for uh, this DSA, it's very clear that this is one of the, the, the new frontiers, if you like, um, of knowledge. And Vanessa was always very alert to new frontiers. I was gonna say, she was, she was a deeply fashionable human being in herself, always immaculately and beautifully turned out. Um, but she had this kind of sixth sense of always of, of what was happening, who was saying things and what it might mean and where there may be challenges uh, appropriate to that. And she certainly was acutely aware uh, of what the new kinds of debates about flows of capital and superpower struggles would imply. Um, she'd had a long and enduring an interest in questions of infrastructure and real estate always in the context of Cape Town. Um, and as a planner, I think had always had some kind of sense of oversight and how those issues came together. One of those wonderful attributes when planning is done well is that it, it, it embraces and it incorporates and it brings together and then mediates uh, different forms of knowledge. But for me, what was fascinating was the way that she chose to pick up on this question possibly prompted by her own fury and enragement um, at uh, a particular expression of perverse infrastructure uh, and real estate investment, which had to do with the moving of the urban edge in the city of Cape Town, or the attempted moving of the urban edge um, by what can only be described as corrupt practice. Vanessa then set up what is extraordinary, had never really been done before, a team of people to look very specifically uh, at questions of urban corruption. And that piece that's just come out in Habitat International, some of you might want to have a look at, um, which is one of the first pieces to emerge from that project. So the, the ability to know the issue, understand what is already there and then push the frontier. And it seems to me that that's one of the things which an engaged urbanist is able to do. Again, both conceptually, empirically and operationally. Uh, to echo what my colleagues have said before. And then your final theme, Karen, 
um, on global targets and the local policy and governance issues. You know, so how does one deal with the localization agenda? You know, this is such a fraught issue. There's some parts of, of the urban studies community where you talk about voluntary national reviews and Sendai and the Paris Agreement, and I just glaze over. I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And then there are other parts of the urban community, including many places of practice, particularly in the African context, where that's what the agenda has, in a sense, uh, been reduced to. And I think Vanessa's role here is quite an interesting one. And I might remind you, if you, you weren't aware of it, that that 2009 piece um, that uh, you and Habitat put out on planning, Vanessa was one of the lead authors on that. Um, and you know, so she's not the only voice in this, but it's a critical and a loud voice in it, um, which asserted the importance of planning, particularly the importance of planning in African cities. And that goes against what was happening in many other parts of the world, where there was a tendency to be rejecting the role of planners, to only be critical of planners, always cautious and, 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 and um, uh, dismissive of, of the top-down uh, role of, of the state. And I think in that piece, she was, re was able to lay very important foundational ground for what can only be described as a pro-planning, pro-urban position. And that for me was really formative in setting out the African endorsement of those what we now think of as the global urban agenda. In other words, that umbrella, that, that basket, if you like, uh, of global agreements where African nations have signed up to these particular agendas. And so I think what I take from that is that Vanessa was here was, was, was deeply in touch with global movements, global trends, global arguments, even participating in their formative moments, but she was never a hack. And the example that I use of that, and if you haven't read, there's a piece by Jane Battersby and Vanessa um, in the Tom Planning Review um, in 2019, where she basically takes apart the new urban agenda and looks for the question of food and finds it missing, um, a fundamental question in looking uh, at issues of rights and looking at issues which concern the urban poor. And if we think that that was important then, and we think of post-pandemic conditions, we know uh, how absolutely significant some of those kinds of emissions were in the defining of those global agendas. So to go back to where we started perhaps, um, and just to wind up my contribution here, I do not think Vanessa is the only person who is an exemplar of what we might think of as engaged urbanism or Southern urbanism. I do, however, think that she represented a high point in the recrafting of a mode of being an urbanist, a way of seeing like a planner, a position which puts the city for all at the foreground of what they do, and in the process adopts what is perhaps not a single point of entry into the urban question, but one that is multiple, one that is pragmatic, one that is critical, and one that is reflexive. And I'll leave you with that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh, there's so much to think about there. And I have to say also, so you evoked so many memory, my memories as well, so much of Vanessa's role in, in those different ways. So thank you to our three speakers really for, I think, um, a, a really a beautiful um, a recognition and acknowledgement of Vanessa's really important role in our field, um, in our field of of practice, and I mean practice uh, in, in all its senses uh, and, and all its ways. Um, we're going to open up now to, to questions, and we, we have two questions tabled already. Um, I might, if you don't mind, just expand a little bit on those questions to open up some of the conversation, but if I could just encourage our audience uh, as you reflect um, to, to add to those questions, please. Um, so the first question uh, um, is, is a question to Mona. 
how do you engage with municipal staff? Can you describe their attitude to your proposed process? Do they feel as though their involvement could help realize the plans? And do you think this could have a lasting impact on governance? So I would like to, yes, Mona, I will hand it over to you first, but I would like Gotham perhaps to give some thought to how you think municipal governance and local governments has a role in the kind of universal agenda and the, the specificities of the agenda that you raised around social protection. Because I think they're obviously a very important actor, but we think primarily of the nation state when we think about universalization. And, and I think it's important to hear, to think about local, local and regional governments and what is their role as well in a kind of more multi-governance kind of uh, notion. And, and then uh, Sue, I wonder if you could similarly um, take on that the the role you think that um, that local government may have in a, in a sense you've alluded much more to the practice specifically the engagement of Vanessa's practice in navigating these deep differences, but uh, perhaps just to think a little bit more about how planning. Um, and I, I think really what we're doing is like, um, in a sense, opening up ve the very notion of planning itself, that we're not just talking about planning by the state, but we're talking about plannings, planning by collectives of, of communities and of, of, of different actors, um, how you think local government um, has a role within that. So Mona, let's start with you. Sure. Um... I'll, I'll try to be brief uh, and, and just say that, I mean, just really an answer to, uh, to this question that um, we didn't start talking to the municipality when the peer report blast happened. And I think this is critical. These are 20 years in which we've engaged public authorities uh, as researchers, as urbanists uh, in multiple ways. And I have to say that in the beginning, it was very much as activists denouncing all the time uh, shortcomings, weaknesses. But then there's a point where you get tired of just saying it doesn't work. And you find that everyone around you is also convinced it doesn't work. And you're challenged to say, can I get them to do anything else? Can I take their place? And in 2016, I uh, ran with um, with colleagues and we put out an electoral campaign and we wanted to take the place of the elected authorities. And, um, and that's when we really discovered first that it was very difficult for many reasons to, to put a plan that works given the national structures and the limitations, but also that the municipality was actually a much more complex institution than, it was, than we thought. And I have to say that after that, I began to realize that I had to make myself useful to them as a research center so that they feel they have to, they can use me and, and, I, and they can work with us. And so uh, collecting data, making the first map of Beirut that they didn't have, taking, taking it to them and saying, hey, look, we've done this. Is it useful to you? Can we collaborate? Do you want to give me a piece of your archive that I can scan? All of this began to create an interaction. And I said very deliberately with pieces of the state and usually non-elected pieces of the state because they're less counting on the short term of the election or how this will make them look and more on, uh, on, on, on the longer term transformation. So they're possibly more open to change and it's a very rocky road and it's very incremental. The other thing I will say is it doesn't mean that you can do that on your own. It has to be an ecosystem. So if the activists are not actually denouncing what the municipality is doing, you can't pretend to be sort of the person coming to talk to them and creating the pressure on them. So I think the fact that we've had an ecosystem and we've built public knowledge around urban issues for about the last 10 years, um, on very specific urban issues has uh, sort of created the possibility for us to imagine now that we're able to bring some of the municipal agents on board. I hope this helps. Thank you, that, that was very clear. Gotham, would you like to pick up my challenge? Yeah, I think, you know, in India, and you know this, Karen, I think we struggle with very weak municipal and local government. The Indian constitutional settlement has long been the, you know, we, we have a basically missing third tier of urban government, and it's something that we have struggled with for a very long time. 
Um, so I think, you know, it's very hard to assess even the possibilities of what the municipal or the local government could do, because for us, the decentralization debate is literally between the central government in Delhi and the state governments. And that's how it played out with social protection as well. But I think that one of the things that social protection pushes you to do is to actually use the limitations of working at even the state level and say this is never going to be enough. So in the last couple of years during the pandemic, the importance of more empowered municipal and local governments has really become, uh, I think, a central part of the agenda that I think is pivotal to pick up. And I think that one of the ways I can imagine the municipal entering this social protection conundrum that I laid out differently is in two ways. One is I think that that question of the design of a delivery system within urban infor informal urbanization, I think is something that can only work at the municipal scale. So for example, do you go universal by entering through particular spatial typologies of inhabitation, known vulnerable neighborhoods, proxy, do you, do you enter not through occupation category or citizenship, but actually through spatial residence? What is a social protection program look like that targets for example, industrial areas, known peri-urban areas of, of low-income housing, looking at older forms of spatial um, uh, inequality like the quote-unquote slum or the urban villages or unauthorized colonies or different kinds of housing typologies. Only at the municipal scale can we imagine new bases of designing the delivery of social protection. And I think that in many cases, it was not this municipal government, but a lot of work was metropolitan in character. So Bangalore, Delhi, Hyderabad, Pune, all did very different forms of relief delivery and effectively acted like local governments. And I think there's a lot to learn from what that proximity and that scale gave. And the last point I want to make, it picks up something that um, Sam has put in the chat. Municipal governments in our experience of pandemic tend to be more embedded into already existing partnerships with other local actors. They work better or can be made, let me say it differently, can be made to work better in partnerships than state or central governments or higher scales of government. And I think the question of coalitions and unlikely partnerships between unions, resident associations, social movements, you know, tech firms, um, NGOs, and the local government, this compact is possible at the municipal in a way that it's not. And in fact, a lot of the mutual aid and relief work during COVID around the world effectively modeled the municipal state non-state partnerships. So I think there's a lot to scratch there, um, but it's a long fight for us in India because of the structure of our governance system. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you for linking it to Sam's uh, a very clear and good question here. Sue, would you like to come back on this? And do link to any of the other questions as you- Well, as you perhaps ask. then just to use that question um, as one of the links. I mean, I think the first thing you have to do is, is the point that you, you have to know your local government because local government is not the same in every place. It has very different kinds of capacities. Um, and, and the question from uh, Nismal is, is, is equally related. Not every place um, has the same needs. Um, so I think that's that for me is one of the things. I mean, what, what is absolutely clear, though, is that it is almost, I, I would say it is universally true um, that it is impossible to do, to act without some form of coordination and curation of a stable in, and enduring partner. And if that is an elected government, that's fantastic because there's a degree of accountability to that. Um, and if it isn't, then making it so that it can be accountable in some way is a good thing to do. And so, Mano, I was fascinated by your point of, of this shift from always the oppositional to the recognition of the multiplicity of roles and functions that are required to literally rebuild or to build from scratch. And it seems to me that in that concert of, of, of organs of that need to be there, local government of some size and shape is necessary. It is never sufficient. It's never sufficient, even from a government point of view. Okay. Um, the idea that mayors can do everything is just wrong. Um, and it certainly is, particularly in very poor places, not true that we can 
that they can do without any other form of organized civil society. So, um, I mean, in terms of how do you make that work? Um, so my, my just, my, I mean, it's, a, it's trite at one level, but I, I do think you've got to be really careful that we don't ask too much of, organ, of, of institutions which are not designed for that purpose. So you want to think carefully about what you really want local government to do. And so for me, me, there's some quite simple basics. I actually think, think that they're the curator of information about a place. You know, it's like, where are the taps? Where should the taps be? Some of those kinds of levels of basic information. They may or may not be the providers of services. Um, they almost always have the capacity to convene. And that seems to me to be really important. So to bring people together. Um, and, and they quite often have the capacity to speak on behalf of residents uh, with other parts of government or to other parts of civil society. And so I think being much clearer about that and not overburdening the role of municipalities is the first step uh, in an effective collaboration. But yeah, others may have other views. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think this question of, of, act, of who actors are and what happens when they step into, other shoe, into the shoes of other actors is very um, important. And, I think the second question, the, the next question here is um, uh, the condition of civil society in Lebanon is much different in countries with strong government and state like Jordan, for example. How do you reflect on pushing the actors and making the legitimacy of planning when the actors themselves, either activists or professionals and others, don't want to wear this hat in order not to be so visible to the state. So that's quite an important question. Mona, I don't know if you want to come back on that. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, I, I mean, I live in a city where not even one in 10 person actually votes for local government. So the, the structures of accountability that you imagine normally vis-a-vis -vis local authorities uh, are impossible. And yet, uh, individuals share the spaces in which they live, and there needs to be a way in which uh, the collective is, is organized. We have plenty of, uh, of experiences of thinking through this in, in planning theory, from the idea that individuals encroach silently with Asaf Bayad, uh, to the fact that this becomes a form of organizing one's life with James Holston, for example, but also with Faranak Miraftab's work in uh, Global Heartland, where she talks about how people um, who are actually illegal migrants in the US where they're undesired organize their everyday life and create institutions that allow them to create the spaces that they need to be able to, uh, to sort of plan those collective spaces. So I think for me, what is really important is that uh, residents who live in specific individuals neighborhoods, actors usually know what is the limit they have in negotiation. And that's the entry point for being able to, to then encourage uh, how you build on that knowledge and you encourage it so that you can create a conversation beyond how one men's one owns need to have one thinks about a collective. And I really think this is what planning is. It's also politics. It's also a lot of things, but it's about thinking through the space that we share. And, and, and I think in the most uh, dictatorial space, there still is that room for maneuver that people know how to build. So I, I think that's where one starts. So in a sense, you are also talking to Sam's question about reform coalitions, uh -huh. uh, building those coalitions and working, working through them. Um, uh, I wonder, uh, Gotham, would you like to pick up on the question of the role of ICT? in the context of, um, of, of social protection around biometric data collection, uh, the possession uh, of, uh, uh, of valid ID cards, which in itself can be quite challenging uh, issue. Um, let, let me hand over to you. No, absolutely. I can, I, I, you know, I think that this is the point that I was trying to make, right, that there is an important but also very seductive idea about using ICT leverage and you know the language in the question I mean you know you see we when you talk about ICT we end up using the word beneficiaries again right because it takes us in a certain direction and I think the tension that I'm pointing to is exactly this it isn't about only the technical ability to link someone's 
body data, and I'm saying body because it's biometric, it's an important concern here to flag about questions of privacy and state surveillance and the counter of that inclusion. But even if you put that aside for a bit, it is the terms of recognition. Who are you giving social protection to as what? The minute we start doing and focusing on the delivery technological infrastructure, we almost erase the importance of the question on saying, what is this entitlement recognizing? And that's where the question of understanding that claims made as workers. So I'll give you an example with what a lot of technology-based delivery is doing. For a lot of informal workers, you are now able to get benefits like food, like cash relief, like pension, but not maternity leave, but not unemployment insurance, but not protection from illness and injury at workplace. There is a reason. There is a reason why certain parts of social protection do not fall into the delivery efficiency mechanism technology, because they have to be politically negotiated as rights to labor. And the history of the fight for rights, and it is a fight for rights. So one of the things that Vanessa was very good about is that when she talked about planning, she always talked about the necessity for scholarship to tell us what the state should not do as much as what the state should do. And it is, goes back to Sam's point about coalitions. It goes back to the point about working with the state. When one works with the state, as I do, as a breeder and scholar of her work, it's not because I want the state to do everything like Sue's saying. There's plenty of times I work with the state to say, don't do this. Don't step in here. Don't over control this. Don't micromanage this. Let institutions work support, recognize, and enable, right? So I think that while I think technology has a very strong role, I want to first not treat this as an efficiency problem, but remind ourselves we are constructing an architecture of citizenship. Social protection is, protection is an architecture of citizenship. And the terms of recognition have to be decided before the modalities of delivery can be made. Um, at the same time, I empathize very much with your concern, and I want to explore this possibility of ICT, because once those political categories are set as workers, recognized as workers, there is a delivery technology infrastructure story to be told. And who controls that delivery? What is the role of unions and work organizations in digital infrastructure? What is the accountability of technology-based delivery institutions? This is the stuff that we have to think through very carefully. So we have to fight both these battles at the same time. But I would say that there has to be priority to the architecture of those claims, the recognition of those rights before we can talk about the technical delivery infrastructure. Because otherwise, we can lose in the name of efficiency very clear questions of accountability and equity. And I think that is something that technology risks and we must be wary of, while not ever in a dialogue about Vanessa Watson, throw the baby out with the bathwater, even on technology and digitalize it. Yes, indeed. And I think linked to this question of technology, um, Sue, can I come to you uh, on the question of evidence-based policy and the whole notion of big data and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the question here, how does that affect the all important triad of the operational, the normative and the analytical. Is there a danger that the latter two might be displaced in pursuit of evidence and the empirical? Would you like to come back on that? That's a really lovely phrasing of that question, Nandini. Um, and, and I think it might actually, if one had time to get a number of people to kind of reflect on that. Um, almost as a challenge to a new mode of, of practice. I mean, I think if I think back on Vanessa, what Vanessa's work does there, which for me is helpful, and as a non-planner, what I think planners can do and should do and better um, is they ground that in place. Um, and so I think as soon as you have a normative position, which um, is very really clear about inequality, in other words, you are clear that things don't happen in the same way to everybody um, at the same time for reasons that have to do with issues of power, your normative base, um, you really become very acutely aware of what should we do for who, where, and who should do that. And those are empirical questions, but they are also deeply normative questions, and they are the fundamental questions of most theoretical endeavor. Um, and so I think um, the, it's where I think we see people departing from that is when they either don't have a normative base, they don't care who is included or excluded, or they don't know anything about a place. In other words, they genuinely don't understand the, the city. 
um, or they don't understand how the city works. Um, in other words, they don't know who does what. And I think if you can hold on to those things, you actually, you, you, you hopefully can get closer. But I found your, your, your framing of that question actually really um, provocative. I'd like to go away and think about it a bit more. <laughs> well, I'd like to um, thank our, our audience for these uh, very provocative questions. And I would especially like to thank our speakers today uh, for a truly wonderful acknowledgement of Vanessa's work at the same time as telling the stories, your own stories of your own engagement in a way that I know Vanessa would relish. Uh, she would love to be engaged with that process in the way that, that you did it. Um, and so, uh, I, I think that for me, one of the most powerful things, and if I can borrow terms from each of you, Gotham, I think you really started something in pulling together the normative, analytical and operational dimensions, which are so central to her work. And I can see that as a theme carrying through into the DSA conference in all sorts of ways. And uh, Mona, I, I, I love that, that term that you use, the stitching. And I can see there's a lot of stitching to be done in, in maintaining those normative, analytical and, and, and operational processes, um, not just between the actors, but between the processes themselves. Um, and, and Sue, I think all of this has to be done, as you said, uh, on behalf of, 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 of well, that Vanessa wasn't interested. Uh, she realized that it wasn't necessarily possible to solve deep div divisions, but you had to navigate them. And I think that this, these are the kind of broad tools that she brought with her uh, and, and encouraged all of us to engage with in order to, to do that process. So thank you to each of our speakers. You brought something really wonderful to our session today. This is a great, great start uh, leading into the DSA conference. I would like to draw everybody's attention and here I'm going to just quickly share my screen again to the next session, which will be on Wednesday, the 15th of June, uh, a pre-conference webinar, the second pre-conference webinar coming up. Uh, Brack at 50, what can we learn from the world's largest NGO? I think this could be, this will be a truly um, fascinating uh, 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 webinar and that to be followed by a webinar, which is in a sense we touched on in many ways today already on the 23rd of June, what role for the university in bringing about sustainable just futures. If you'd like to attend those webinars, you can sign up for them in the upcoming events on the DSA website. So please uh, do that. And we look forward to seeing you and joining with you and continuing this fascinating conversation. Thank you to everybody. Take care, look after yourselves and see you soon.